We've been joined by Dave Miller and Walt Pagulas. Dave, thanks very much for being here. At the time of the crisis, how old were you and where were you? I was 21 years old. I was out at sea off the coast of Cuba. And do you remember when you were in school in the 1950s, did you see duck and cover? Did you all do civil defense drills? Did you ever do that kind of thing in school? When I was in school, no, I didn't go through that at the time, no. And to his left is Walt Pagulas. Walt, take that microphone and let the kids have an idea of where you were in the 62. Uh, 62, I was a student at Parks College, so I, I was past the duck and cover business. Although we had that in the late uh, 50s grade school, um, that was practice a few times. But again, that's the time prior to the 62. But at 62, it was a um, student at Parks College on the east side of um, Illinois. We're going to talk a little bit more about what they do, but at that period of time in their lives, but I want to give you guys a chance to see the rest of this newsreel footage as the kids practice ducking and covering. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover! This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. But the most important thing of all is to duck and cover yourself, especially where your clothes do not cover you. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Duck. Kind of interesting to think that, you know, that little piece of cloth or a piece of paper would have protected you. And, but that kind of interesting combination of we want to terrify you, but we also want to be kind of a little bit cutesy. When you guys were, you were serving at that period of time, Dave, you were near Cuba serving. Did you guys do any kind of civil defense drills yourself, like on ship or in base or anything like that? Was that a regular part of what you were doing at that point? In the Navy, you constantly have drills every day. It's something they, they instill in you every day, running drills so you react quicker to any signs of emergency. Yes. And Walt, the same thing in terms of you guys, I mean, in your ROTC training? Uh, RVC training, we didn't do any drills as such. Uh, the duck and cover, I remember that in grade school mm -hmm. primarily. That was before I came to the St. Louis area. Uh, but as ROTC, we were more mindful of the fact of what was transpiring. And uh, when this incident took place, uh, it brought the issue right to our forefront. And I have to admit the, uh, the drills that we had, or just merely the topics that were being discussed during ROTC classes, it became very paramount. This is real stuff, real stuff. Oh my, there's a picture of somebody. That's a picture of you, <laughs> I think, Walt, just a few years ago. Well, this is a summer camp that uh, I had between my um, uh, second and third year at uh, Waco, Texas. And all, well, there's just before I left for summer camp, all dressed up, but uh, in a uh, doctrination flight mm -hmm. for all the uh, cadets, quite a, 30 days out in the sun of Texas. So Dave, when you were serving aboard ship, you were serving in the Caribbean near Cuba during the crisis time, or was that your general assignment in that period of time, like during those two weeks, that two month period? We happened to be down there during that period of time, and we were off. My understanding was we were just off the coast of Cuba at that time. And what was your job? What was your particular part of that? At that particular time, I was working on the deck force. I was in second division, which we maintained the ship at the aft end at the time. And uh, we, we maintained the ship and we took care of the mic boats and any transportation from the ship to shore. And Painting kept the rust from appearing on ship, which was a constant endeavor. I bet it was. Let's go to other student questions. Lions Creek Middle School down in Florida. Lions Creek, if you guys have a question, come on in and say hello. Uh, the question for Mary was, what caused her sister to die? 
Jack, would you mind handing the microphone to Mary? And Mary, give the audience a, a little bit of information now because we haven't met you yet, but your family's originally from Cuba and you actually had a, had a, 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 a half-sister half half -sister who was in Cuba still after the revolution, right? Yes. Um, my father was from Cuba. He was a physician who came to the United States prior to the revolution. Um, however, he had two daughters from his first marriage, my half-sisters, Lili, who then subsequently did come to the United States, and Alicia, who would have been my old, oldest sister. And um, she was in Cuba at the time. She had two young children, and um, her husband was a, a fairly high-ranking member in Castro's regime. She did not agree with that, and she really wanted to leave. My father tried to send private planes over to extricate her and the two children from the island, but um, I guess her husband, you know, was not in agreement with that. She was expecting a baby, so um, at the time, she I think she was almost ready to give birth. She was probably eight and a half, nine months pregnant, and something went wrong with the pregnancy, and she was taken to the hospital, and um, unfortunately, um, there, there wasn't anything that they could do to save her. I'm sure that there, there was much turmoil and that whatever medical facilities were available at the time, a, a pregnant woman was not you know, the, very high on their priority list. So um, sadly, um, she died. And um, it was uh, one of the only two times I ever saw my dad cry uh, when he was given word that she had passed away. He, he obviously felt terrible because um, as a doctor, I'm sure he blamed himself thinking that if he had been there, he could have helped her and also feeling very badly that he wasn't successful in being able to get them off of the island. Thanks very much for that question, Lions Creek. You'll have a chance to learn more from Mary later when we meet her in a little bit more depth. Let's go back to our friends down in Texas, Del Valley, Texas. Another question from you. What was the tension level on Navy ships? We were down there the first time we even knew anything about what was going on. It was in the evening time, we were on the after well deck to watch a movie, and it was just starting to turn dark, and they were setting up the screen, and all of a sudden we had a P-2V Neptune anti-submarine plane come over and throw the spotlight on us. None of us at the time knew what was going on, and then on the loudspeaker came the voice, from the uh, captain telling us to go into condition three sailing. And that was the first instance that we knew that anything was going on. Condition three sailing is combat sailing in times of war in the Navy. It's just below general quarters or actual battle stations. And they did not put this as a drill beforehand. They just said, go into condition three sailing. And that's the first we knew something was going on. We did not know it had anything to do with Cuba or anything at the time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much for that question. We've talked a lot about, he mentioned the, the planes coming down and that were obviously from uh, not America at that point in time, but Cuba. We want to give you an idea about what these planes look like that uh, we were using for spying ourselves and what some of these images were that Stevenson was showing to the, the world at the United Nations. So the first picture we're going to show you is of a U-2 spy plane. And this is uh, the U-2 spy plane, which is image, I believe, 26, if I'm remembering correctly, for those who are bringing it up in the wonderful world of the backstage here. You get to see a U-2 spy plane. And this is the, probably the most famous of the spy planes of the time. If you may be familiar with your history, Gary Powers shot down over the Soviet Union. But it was actually a lower level reconnaissance spy plane that gives us a lot of the really, really good shots. And that's known as a voodoo that was actually built by the McConnell Douglas folks right here in St. Louis, Missouri. And that's what you're seeing there. And the, the images that they're able to show us give us some really good low level stuff. And what we want to show you is a little bit of comparison between before and after, how they were sure of what was going on. So we're going to go to image 12, which was a site in Cuba that before uh, the missile sites were actually there. And this is from August of 1962. And what you see is just your basic everyday farmland in Cuba. Note the box over to the left that's marked out for us, which now shows you absolutely nothing. But by the time we get to the middle of October in 1962 in our next image, this is what they saw inside that box. 
So by this period of time, they're noticing that there's a, a, a plant developing, they're noticing their construction materials, they're noticing a storage site, they're noticing a whole wide variety of things that looks like a nuclear missile site. The next image goes back to again another location in Cuba prior to the war, prior, prior to the crisis I should say, back again in August of 1962. A different place where again we're seeing cloud cover and some land. And again, the area in the box, by the middle of October 1962, this is what they're seeing. Much more, you see trucks, you see fuselages, they realize that there's all sorts of activity going on. So it's these images as well as other images that Stevenson and the President are showing to the world as they begin to tell everybody what's happening. Let's go to more student questions. New Franklin, Missouri, what else would you like to know? Do you, think if, do you think that if we knew exactly where every missile was that we would have raided Cuba? The speculation was that we knew where some of them were because there was an intent coverage, but we did not know all the missile sites, all the locations for missiles, all the locations for the planes, but it seemed a tremendous change in personality as a nation on the part of Russia setting up a uh, base so close to our area and as the lady spoke at the very beginning we were living with the realization Russia was so far away and now this country that we didn't trust at all nor did they trust us uh, set up a base 90 miles from our shore and it became a very high intense concern on the part of the military and the response I think was measured and the prudent reaction that Kennedy and, and his staff, his office, and the military uh, undertook was very real. Uh, not to be jumping around, but the fact was that there was, there was disagreement within the administration as to what the course of action was. It is a known fact that the chief of staff for the Air Force, a gentleman by the name of Curtis LeMay, who was a war hero from World War II, he was ready to bomb all the sites, all the country uh, within Cuba. And you can imagine what that would have taken place. It, uh, it was a trying time, and uh, it's uh, a realization that as time moved on, uh, news information, news coverage was a plus. Sometimes it gets to be too detailed, and you don't get the full fact, but uh, th this was a trying time. The image you're seeing right now is of Kennedy signing the quarantine order. Um, we also have an image, uh, image one, of the president with General Curtis LeMay and some other members of the military, including one of the U-2 spy pilots, and that's the picture you're seeing right there. It's General Curtis LeMay that is closest to the president. And in fact, we know now that there were invasion plans that they had also developed. If we go to image um, 25, then you're going to see uh, a map of an invasion plan of Cuba, which the CIA was using at, at the time. Uh, this is actually from the uh, Military History Quarterly. It was published after the fact. But they had invasion plan ideas. They had ideas potentially for airstrikes. They had the possibility where we're going to utilize nuclear missiles ourselves. There was a number of options that were available to the president. He chose the quarantine, and that wasn't necessarily a popular option within his own sphere of advisors, uh, specifically from the military circle. Let's go to another question from our student group. Spencer, Wisconsin, what would you like to know? Were you guys really worried about the Cuban Missile Crisis and like, what was going through your mind? Walt, do you remember being scared at the time? My realization of this is no joke was the fact that I would travel by Lambert Airport, which is the St. Louis um, uh, major airport, only one at that particular time, uh, going back home uh, to visit my, uh, my mother, and one night I was coming back from, um, from Iowa and we passed Lambert Field and we knew there's commercial flights in and out, but lo and behold, at the southeast corner of the airfield, which was right adjacent to 70, or 70 was adjacent to it, were three B-47 bombers. Uh, again, being Air Force ROTC, expecting to be a, a pilot, uh, I knew what they were. They had never been stationed there. Um, they were armed, oh, excuse me, I can't say they were armed, but they were uh, stationed with lights on and military police around. You could see them, I mean, this was visual, it was right there. You knew they were not there to deliver garbage, 
<laughs> there was a purpose for it, plus we had heard stories as to what was taking place. So naturally us ROTC boys would run over there and look at them. And then we had, of course, the announcement by President Kennedy. And that brought everything into focus, such as uh, there was great concern. Not that we were going to go out there and do silly things, but there was a purpose to us becoming cadets, becoming officers, and uh, it, it was a trying time. There's, there's no doubt about it. And Dave, did at some point in time you on the ship realize we are in this crisis with Cuba specifically? At the time when we went into Condition 3 sailing, we had no idea what was going on at the time. Uh, I do know that the ship did change course. We were under, the, well, we can tell by the direction and the sun and all. We were heading north. The type of ship I was on is an AGC. It's an amphibious group command ship. And they carry the general or the admiral in charge of an invasion force. So if there was to be an invasion of Cuba, my ship would have been involved because we would have had the general in charge of that invasion on that ship. And we did, trying to jump the story a little bit, we ended up in Jacksonville loading the FMF or the Fleet Marine Force with a bunch of other U.S. Navy amphibious ships to go back to Cuba. And that's where we ended up in. So at the actual time, we were not aware of who, what all the excitement was about. So all the sailors were excited because finally we got to do something that we were being trained for, but against who we had no idea. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Walt. Thanks both of you very much for being with us and sharing your part of the story.